The Widow of Galithia by Thomas Hood This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. There lived in the province of Galithia a lady so perfectly beautiful that she was called by travellers, and by all indeed who beheld her, the flower of Spain. It too frequently happens that such handsome women are but as beautiful weeds, useless or even noxious, whereas with her excelling charms she possessed all those virtues which should properly inhabit in so lovely a person. She had therefore many wooers, but especially a certain old knight of Castile, bulky in person and with hideously coarse features who, as he was exceedingly wealthy, made the most tempting offers to induce her to become his mistress, and failing in that object by reason of her strict virtue, he proposed to espouse her. But she, despising him as a bad and brutal man, which was his character, let fall the blessing of her affection on a young gentleman of small estate but good reputation in the province and being speedily married they lived together for three years very happily notwithstanding this the abominable knight did not cease to persecute her till being rudely checked by her husband and threatened with his vengeance he desisted for a season it happened at the end of the third year of their marriage that her husband being unhappily murdered on his return from madrid whither he had been called by a lawsuit she was left without protection, and, from the failure of the cause, much straitened, besides, in her means of living. This time, therefore, the knight thought favourable to renew his importunities, and neither respecting the sacredness of her grief, nor her forlorn state, he molested her so continually that if it had not been for the love of her fatherless child, she would have been content to die for if the knight was odious before, he was now thrice hateful from his undisguised brutality, and above all execrable in her eyes from a suspicion that he had procured the assassination of her dear husband. She was obliged, however, to confine this belief to her own bosom, for her persecutor was rich and powerful, and wanted not the means, and scarcely the will, to crush her many families had thus suffered by his malignity and therefore she only awaited the arrangement of certain private affairs to withdraw secretly with her scanty maintenance into some remote village there she hoped to be free from her inhuman suitor but she was delivered from this trouble in the meantime by his death yet in so terrible a manner as made it more grievous to her than his life had ever been it wanted, at this event, but a few days of the time when the lady proposed to remove to her country lodging, taking with her a maid who was called Maria, for since the reduction of her fortune she had retained but this one servant. Now it happened that this woman, going one day to her lady's closet, which was in her bedchamber, so soon as she had opened the door, there tumbled forward the dead body of a man and the police being summoned by her shrieks, they soon recognised the corpse to be that of the old Castilian knight, though the countenance was so blackened and disfigured as to seem scarcely human. It was sufficiently evident that he had perished by poison, whereupon the unhappy lady being interrogated was unable to give any account of the matter and in spite of her fair reputation, and although she appealed to God in behalf of her innocence, she was thrown into the common jail along with other reputed murderers. The criminal addresses of the deceased knight being generally known, many persons who believed in her guilt still pitied her, and excused the cruelty of the deed on account of the persecution she had suffered from that wicked man. But these were the most charitable of her judges. The violent death of her husband, which before had been only attributed to robbers, was now assigned by scandalous persons to her own act, and the whole province was shocked that a lady of her fair seeming, and of such unblemished character, should have brought so heavy a disgrace upon her sex and upon human nature. 
At her trial, therefore, the court was crowded to excess, and some few generous persons were not without a hope of her acquittal. But the same facts, as before, being proved upon oath, and the lady still producing no justification, but only asserting her innocence, there remained no reasonable cause for doubting of her guilt. The public advocate then began to plead, as his painful duty commanded him, for her condemnation. He urged the facts of her acquaintance and bad terms with the murdered knight, and, moreover, certain expressions of hatred which she had been heard to utter against him. The very scene and manner of his destruction, he said, spoke to her undoubted prejudice. The first a private closet in her own bedchamber and the last by poison, which was likely to be employed by a woman rather than any weapon of violence. Afterwards he interpreted to the same conclusion the abrupt flight of the waiting maid, who, like a guilty and fearful accomplice, had disappeared whenever her mistress was arrested. And finally he recalled the still mysterious fate of her late husband, so that all who heard him began to bend their brows solemnly and some reproachfully on the unhappy object of his discourse. Still she upheld herself firmly and calmly, only from time to time lifting her eyes towards heaven. But when she heard the death of her dear husband touched upon, and in a manner that laid his blood to her charge, she stood forward and placing her right hand on the head of her son cried, So witness God! If ever I shed his father's blood, so may this, his dear child, shed mine in vengeance. Then sinking down from exhaustion, and the child weeping bitterly over her, the beholders were again touched with compassion, almost to the doubting of her guilt. But the evidence being so strong against her, she was immediately condemned by the court. It was the custom in those days for a woman who had committed murder to be first strangled by the hangman, and then burnt to ashes in the midst of the marketplace. But before this horrible sentence could be pronounced on the lady, a fresh witness was moved by the grace of God to come forward in her behalf. This was the waiting woman, Maria, who hitherto had remained disguised in the body of the court but now being touched with remorse at her lady's unmerited distresses she stood up on one of the benches and called out earnestly to be allowed to make her confession she then related that she herself had been prevailed upon by several great sums of money and still more by the artful and seducing promises of the dead knight to secrete him in a closet in her lady's chamber but that of the cause of his death she knew nothing except that upon a shelf she had placed some sweet cakes mixed with arsenic to poison the rats, and that the knight, being rather gluttonous, might have eaten of them in the dark, and so died. At this probable explanation the people all shouted one shout, and the lady's innocence being acknowledged, the sentence was ordered to be reversed. But she, reviving a little at the noise, and being told of this providence, only clasped her hands, and then, in a few words, commending her son to the guardianship of good men, and saying that she could never survive the shame of her unworthy reproach, she ended with a deep sigh, and expired upon the spot. End of The Widow of Galicia by Thomas Hood Read by Noel Badrian